So I want to welcome our incredible VC panel. Um, I'm sure many of you have questions for them, and hopefully you can find them during lunch. Uh, but this panel is made up, the reason we chose this panel uh, is because every single one of these investors has ties to immigrant and international entrepreneurs. So one of them, uh, Manan Mehta, is actually one of the first people that Anastasia and I ever spoke with. Um, he was somebody who encouraged us to do this. He invests in international entrepreneurs himself, immigrant founders, and he is a managing partner at Unshackled Ventures. Some of you may have already heard of it. Second, we have Nico Benatzos, who is a Greek immigrant himself. He is the managing director. Uh, he, he actually invests in early stage entrepreneurs at General Catalyst, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And one of my favorite quotes that he says frequently is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Um, the third person I'd like to introduce is Olivia Wang. She is the vice president and head of the United States at a Chinese fund called Zen Fund. Uh, this fund invests in international entrepreneurs as well, particularly in China. And she is actually an immigrant from China herself. Uh, finally, our moderator is Ben Orthlieb. He is the managing partner at Off The Grid Ventures, and he invests in Off The Grid entrepreneurs, so women, international entrepreneurs, and he is French by descent. So give a warm welcome to our VC panel. Thank you. I 
Christmas Eve here for anybody who's interested. <laughs> and, uh, for the lunch later. Exactly, for the lunch later, spice it up a little bit. Um, grew up between Greece and the UK, uh, lived in uh, Tokyo, tried to do some research in Boston, and ended up here 10 years ago to go to Stanford. And Professor Tom Cosmic was one of my professors, so it's nice to see you here Tom, today. Um, and the last eight years have been completely our firm, so very excited about the investing in immigrants because I don't know any better. <laughs> That's a good reason. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm Manan Mehta, I'm one of the founding partners of Unshackled Ventures. We are a very early stage venture fund designed specifically for immigrant entrepreneurs. And, and what I mean by that is we are unafraid to lead. We've led 90% of our early stage investments. Um, we, we have a structure that can sponsor visa holders. So we started the firm about four years ago in concept, made our first investment three years ago. Um, and have now sponsored over 40 visas in the last two and a half years um, across obviously two distinct administrations in the United States, uh, the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Uh, we've been fortunate to have 100% approval across the board. And so one of the major parts that we, we focus on is how do you remove bottlenecks uh, and obstacles for the best immigrant entrepreneurs? And from a thesis and investing perspective, we, we really do enjoy the harder the technology, the more likely we are to get excited by it. Uh, we aren't afraid of being earlier than anybody else, and I mean by that is um, we want to find a technology that will hit a market inflection in the next one or two years. If it's obvious to Nico, then it's probably too late for us. He should be investing, not us, right? And so we tend to be a little bit more of a contrarian in our view, and we've been fortunate to have founders from now 16 different countries of birth, um, and we are now investing out of our second fund, uh, targeting a 25 or 35 million dollar size, and we are uh, hoping to expand what we do. So maybe staying with you, Manon, um, why did you start with the thesis of foreign entrepreneurs, and how is that playing out, both in terms of the good and the ugly, what are the risks, what are the yeah. benefits of doing that? So for me, my, my personal background, I'm actually born and raised here in Silicon Valley. Um, Where's I'm the accent? Huh? Where's the accent? There's no accent. It's just a very... It's a good accent. Yes, it's a good old beer accent. Um, so I'm the son of immigrants. I'm the son of, of, of parents that came in the 1970s and pursued the so-called American dream. Um, and for me, when I started my first company, about five years ago, it wasn't surprising that I did it with an immigrant co-founder. Little did I know if that you're on an H-1B visa in the United States, you had to have an employer. And that employer oftentimes can't be your own startup for obvious reasons. And so nine months into that journey, um, I realized that there was an incredibly large population of immigrant talent, either U.S. educated or U.S. employed, that was shackled. They, they weren't able to leave their full-time job or stay in the country and work on their business. And so when Shaka was really born out of personal experience, uh, I asked a simple question, why? Why is the best talent trying to come to America? Why is the best talent not being served by America? Uh, and so we, we took it upon ourselves not to wait for political change or legislative change, and we built what we call the privatized version of the Startup Visa Act. Um, and so obviously with that comes a lot of good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the good has been our success rate and our ability to serve this population uh, and really learn from them. Uh, the, the bad has been that you know you have a lot of emotional stress in the market right now. Uh, I think we can't, we can't discount that there's a lot of questions around the status of immigrants globally, not just the U.S. today. Um, and I think that comes with a lot of lack of education in the market. A lot of misinformation for a lot of immigrant founders, and I think that becomes ugly very quickly when people stop building their companies because they're worried about their status. And so, what we what we take on personally is how do we extend this platform to as many people as possible? And and just last week, I can say this: for the very first time, we've opened up our platform to any founders that have raised capital from any investor, and said we will provide the full immigration support to you. Uh, our first company was a YC company that just got into the current batch. Um, and, and to me, that is really furthering the mission. Uh, we have a four-year track record with DHS and DOL to 
Department of Labor, um, and we just want to make sure that we can keep on providing that to other venture funds and other founders. Lita, so you're investing through your fund both in the U.S. and in China. How do you see that as investing here as a foreign fund? And, and maybe you and I were talking a little bit about how you're seeing your, the makeup of your companies here. Sure. I mean, it's definitely it's a huge question. So um, it's interesting because on the other side, if you think about China as um, the main country, um, our founders started one of the first companies to IPO on the New York Stock Exchange from China. It's currently at $11 billion valuation. And one of the products actually sent the last two generations of Chinese students abroad. And so what we have done, and then there's also a movie about the uh, founding of the company that's a bestseller blockbuster movie in China. And so we've built out relationships with the Chinese communities um, at Stanford and Harvard, um, across the top schools, and as well as the top tech companies. And when they come back to China, we often lead the angel or seed round. And in a way, um, they've been abroad for so many years, and then they come back to China. And oftentimes, that immigrant mentality of going back to China is um, a competitive advantage, especially in sectors like enterprise SaaS, FinTech, um, and the hardcore sciences. Um, we've also invested in people who decided to stay in the US and start companies in the US, and that has been a huge drive for them, such as Everstream. We did the seed round in, and they have raised a $60 million Series C a few years back in enterprise SaaS. Um, I think, I guess a couple of stories would be one of the first deals I had done in 2014 and worked on was a guy named Tom Ding. He started a blockchain fundraising company in China. Um, it later shut down and now um, he's built out Zfinity, which is one of the um, layer one competitors to Ethereum, which Polyteno and Dreesen later led. Um, and so uh, Tom Ding grew up in China and went to college when he was 14. Um, he graduated when he was 14, actually, from the top university in Shanghai, worked for eBay in Shanghai for a few years, and actually moved to the US because he wanted to build out this blockchain infrastructure and had a vision for, for it as early as 2013. Um, and he knew he had to come to the US for that because the regulatory environment in Asia um, is too strict. So that is one kind of area where you see like this vision and you see like emerging global sectors where um, different countries are collaborating. Um, and then we have seen immigrant kind of founders and international founders as well in biotech where um, China is really pushing ahead with healthcare trials and hospital data access more quickly, but a lot of the best technology is in the US. So how can data collected abroad help empower U.S. tech engines and biotech? And um, how can U.S. technology help foster great companies globally? So these are two areas that we've thought about a lot and two specific examples that we've worked with. Um, for us, it's a lot about um, kind of industry. Industry trends often drive um, like how founders should be working internationally. Well, in, in our case, you know, we, we uh, like investing in immigrant founders because they, they, frankly, you know, like when they come here, they, don't, they have so much to prove and, and they go the extra mile. Uh, and they're not constrained by their uh, legacy. Uh, a lot of founders, you know, when they're getting started to do something, especially if they're second, third time founders, they have a bunch of legacy in their, in their heads, which is, you know, their network, you know, the way they did things before, um, the all the previous you know, relationships that they had. And it's hard to unlearn all that stuff. Whereas you know, if you're a first timer, and if you're somebody you know, who just moved here, the only thing that you have is to work and be very focused. And inevitably, this constrains you uh, and hopefully makes you think from uh, first principles. Um, so when um, we're thinking about investing in first time founders, and most often they are the ones you know, who are creating the mega outcomes. Um, Having you know, the advantage of coming out of uh, nowhere and grinding it out, uh, going the extra mile is very, very powerful uh, strategy to get going in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you see that in the numbers, right? 51% of the US unicorns have a foreign founder. Yeah. Uh, so that theory plays out. Do you, because you mentioned founders here and say, Manon, you're obviously bringing them here. Do you see? So if having the founding team move to the U.S. or even to the Bay Area as a prerequisite for success or for 
your consideration of an investment. It, it, it's not a, a prerequisite, you know, for us, or I, I can't, you know, like point to numbers where if the whole team moved here, it was, you know, more successful than others. But I have to say, when you invest in um, immigrant founders who are first timers, if they have to manage two offices, the complexity inevitably is higher. So it needs to speak to, uh, it negates their ability to manage and be able to deal with a complex organization. So I've been on both sides. Invested in a team that got started in Germany. Um, they had a really good idea that saw a lot of trucks in here in the US. Uh, launched here, helped them uh, build an office in New York. And then we couldn't figure out the culture between these two different offices. And disaster, you know, for the management team and the whole company and ended up not working out. Um, so it, it, it's, it's always, you know, a delicate, you know, like uh, balance uh, to figure out what matters the most is like the level of ambition that the founders have. So if they really want to serve a worldwide audience, a massive market opportunity, and they see a lot of their customers and here today is being in the US or China, and they themselves go there to be closer to their customers, it's big, this picks to their determination. Olivia, do you see some of those sort of more Chinese and American companies? Uh, and do you have any views on whether they should base themselves here or there, or actually both, as you were saying about data exchanges and bringing markets one way or the other? Um, yeah, I think Nico has you know, brought up a great point. It's definitely more complex when you're managing two offices. For example, we see um, Chinese or American teams that want to expand in China, and we do require them to move to China for a while and really know China before we invest. Um, and then in the US, I think determination is often shown by a willingness to just move everything and be totally involved in the geography that you're working in. And then I had brought up blockchain and biotech because those are two potential exceptions where it may work to your benefit if you have um, an R&D lab in the US and then you are working in China like before the Series B or before the Series C. Oftentimes it's great to capture a home market for a while before going abroad, but for hardware, for blockchain, for some areas, um, it might be worth considering earlier if you can get an engineering team with a specific know-how or with a specific cost center um, in a different country, but only if you know that country really well. Um, and we also think about diversity. I think the Valley thought, thinks a lot about diversity in terms of you know, the male, white male venture capitalist or the white male um, uh, engineer. But from a Chinese fund perspective, we also think you know, Chinese entrepreneurs or immigrant entrepreneurs actually need to have a local Valley founder or a local founder from their jurisdiction. So diversity in that principle kind of applies wherever you go. Yeah, that's a very important topic with a lot of immigrant founders when you invest in them and they have a core team that brings folks from their own country, they need to constrain their uh, approach to recruiting because for person number five, if they also you know, go, go back to the easy option, which is to just hire somebody else from their home country, then before you know it, you have like 15 people, they all look alike, and when you're interviewing for person number 16, it's like, no wonder what's why it's really, really hard. Uh, to compel somebody to come and join you. Yep. Um, You've recreated that country here. Exactly. Interesting. Speaking of countries, maybe, so I like my secrets are France and Canada because great engineering talent and a lot of government subsidies for R&D, so it makes for a great startup land. I, do you, I don't know, do you have like any place where you particularly like to connect with or invest in? <clears throat> so, when you look at our portfolio, you have all six continents covered. I, I recognize there's seven, I'm not going to get to seven. Um, and you have also now 17 countries, I think. And the, the, the reality for us is that we don't source globally. I can't source out of seven billion people. Uh, I'm a small fund, I have to stay focused, but we source domestically. So oftentimes we spend a lot of time at universities. So we, we have you know, nearly 50 partnerships now with universities across the country. Uh, which we, you know, I, I've kind of coined this that I think it's our generation to Alvis Island, our university system. These are oftentimes immigrants that have been walked through the hallways of our U.S. education system and bolded with the American spirit and the American dream, and it's the private sector's job to catch them. Uh, 
Um, and then you add on top of that all the accelerators and incubators that are doing a great job of attracting global talent and filtering them. And then you add on top of the corporate jobs that they come for. There's a lot of people, nearly 1.4 million high skilled immigrants that we know of, that are in this country today. And at the margin, I will say this, they are more entrepreneurial than a native born person because they left their home country. And I think that goes down to the fact that there's a stronger adversity muscle to withstand and tolerate the challenges you're going to face as an entrepreneur. It is not that glorifying. I mean, the, the, what TechCrunch makes it sound like, oftentimes, is that it's so easy, but it is hard. I think everyone here will talk about just how hard it was as an investor to see certain companies struggle, and we know they shouldn't be, but they, they are going to no matter what. And I think it comes down to the people and that adversity muscle, that grit, uh, and so for us, we, we tend to put a filter really down on not what university you went to or, or what job you're working at. I think that kind of traps into this pattern recognition that fails venture returns, especially when you say the biggest returns in venture are the outliers that are the exceptions. So how does pattern recognition work then? It doesn't make sense to me. And so what we look for is a pattern, right? Huh? You did not pay attention to the pattern record. I think you talked about this. You've written a few times about this yeah. as well. And I love what Nico writes because it actually is a later stage investor talking about what a lot of early stage investors should be thinking about. Uh, but overall, I think our focus is much more on what is the distance you've traveled to start your company? Can I learn about that? And then can I invest in you to eliminate the bottlenecks you're facing today, one of which is immigration? Do you guys want to follow up on either your favorite countries and also one of our questions that Manon started for the audience is also what he looks for in a founder, right? Grit very, very clearly comes, comes to the forefront. What are you guys looking at in founders from the special countries or the video? I think um, as we had iterated before diversity, you know, no matter where you go, um, having a diverse team from day one of that hunger and authenticity to what you are doing um, is really important. Yeah, so for us, not very dissimilar to what you just said, ability to learn really quickly, treat every meeting, decision as a learning opportunity because when you're getting started, you might not know much about your space or your business, but four years later, you have to be a world-class domain expert. So when we put you in the room with a Fortune 500 CEO in your sector, that person would be intimidated. So when we have the Stripe founders meet with, or not partner, Ken Sinol, who was back then the CEO of Omnix, Ken was like, oh my god, I've been payment for my entire career. You two moved here from Ireland, and then for years, you know so much about my industry. Uh, so learning ability is number one. Um, number two is, uh, some, some people call it authenticity, others paranoia, a deeper calling to do what you're trying to do. Uh, because starting a company uh, is a like, crazy thing and there's going to be so many ups and downs and but every week you know there's something like my co-founder said that to me the CTO is going to quit we're going to lose our biggest customer the VP of engineering is living with the general counsel there's always you know something going on so you have to go back yeah, <laughs> drives you to go the extra mile and makes you have to give up essentially. And then uh, the third point uh, that we're looking for is insane ambition because you know we're in the business and venture business is such that can only you know like make the math work out if it produces a huge outcome. So level of ambition matters a lot. And you see that you know with the entrepreneurs who are building the iconic companies. How do you measure that or think about that? It's from the uh, all the stuff that uh, the, the founders, you know, uh, are saying to us the stuff they've done before. Like if they left their home country, that's a big statement. If they left, you know, like a, a good, stable uh, job and career they had before, that's another statement. Uh, if they've uh, gone into credit card debt uh, to do what they're doing, uh, is another one. Like the way they're making their product decisions, setting up everything for the long run. They're doing something very different than anybody else. And most of uh, the folks in their uh, next of kin or friends would think of them as crazy, right? Like, these are some of the 
you know, proxies or when they come to us and they want to raise you know, like a bunch of money, uh, they want to hire the most unbelievable people, this speaks to the ambition. Yep. Uh, like most recently, you know, like I ended up investing uh, in, in somebody who moved here from his home country to build a company that can try to reinvent a uh, very boring industry. He did that because in his home country he had signed an autopeak. Uh, with his former employer, and he couldn't, you know, like do that. So he decided to leave his cash life, a cushy life, and work right here to do that. Yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to a, a founder's willingness to make their life harder. And when they willingly do that, I think investors tend to take notice. Um, it gives you that extra nudge across. Um, a positive decision or a negative decision that you probably need. Because at the end of the day, diligence will give you a set of information that, that everyone can equally understand. But it's understanding the human in the company. Um, and I, I think for us, we actually discern between entrepreneurs and founders. Um, and for us, we like entrepreneurs because what that doesn't mean to me is that you're necessarily a domain expert, but it means you are a problem solver. And Nico touched on, it, on the fact that how fast the Stripe brothers was it, were able to learn payment industry in four years. They had no experience really in the industry. They just came in and said, we can solve problems by making a single snippet of code that everyone could use. And in four years, they come out probably knowing more than most major executives at the major banks. That, that is a, an intangible that takes time for an investor to learn. And I would advise a lot of immigrant entrepreneurs to figure out ways in your pitch to articulate that you are an entrepreneur, you are a problem solver, that you are comfortable with the uncomfortable, um, and that you you know you don't have all the answers, because if you did, you'd be in a different stratosphere. But that's my one advice to a lot of founders is, humility is great, we love it. Uh, I think immigrant entrepreneurs as a whole are very humble. Uh, I literally ask them to brag in my, in my pitch meetings, I'm like, I need to know why you were so confident. Um, because you have to learn what they're willing to do. Yeah. One of um, the companies we had invested in um, is called VIP Kid. Um, it's one of the top global ed tech companies. I think the last round was like um, valued them at 1.6 billion. It's this woman in China who hasn't really studied abroad much. Um, isn't from like a very large tech company, and she's brought on tens of thousands of American teachers online doing live stream with um, Asian students, and um, it's like the fastest growing ed tech company. And the sheer vision of like a woman in China who is able to provide jobs to like 30,000 American people and build a top class ed tech company is like insane. And I think now, you know, you've got Facebook, Ali, uh, Facebook, Google, um, Amazon in the US, you've got Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent in China. Um, just to be able to create a new platform <coughs> given the environment, you, you really have to have that hunger. Like in China, there's a company called Toutiao, which is stepping up talent from Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu. You know, people say, um, and, and for, for us, we experience some of these Chinese founders, like, um, it's possible to get tens of uh, tens of millions of monthly revenue um, within the first year um, in China, and you can scale to two million in valuation given the market and the population. That's a seed round, right? Uh, it's like seed will do like five to ten million USD, and then you know they'll do three rounds of fundraising in a year and just scale given just the market. Um, you can feel it in the room sometimes as well. You can feel it the way they am they answer your questions, the way they ask you questions, the way they um, speak and iterate as you go in and build the relationship. I think there's a lot to be said about being in the room and being really present um, to Maybe switching gear a little bit for, for the audience, one of the things that came in our conversations before we came today was the importance of having the right advisors and the right people around your team, especially as you're a foreign entrepreneur. So given the Founders Embassy program and people in the room, I'd love to hear a little bit how you're thinking about your own advisors and maybe also say how a founder who's coming to the US should think about this and even if you have examples from your portfolio, even better. Um. So for us, we have a very simple philosophy on this. The difference between success and failure is oftentimes the right people at the right stage. Um, and that to me goes beyond the founders. So 
one of the one of the kind of big benefits of doing what we've done in the political environment has become very binary on those that want to help immigrants and those that don't. Um, that is an entrepreneur's dream because when there's a binary outcome, you know how to operate. Gray is hard. And so what we've been able to do is, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to be by some of the more influential families, and you can read about that, but more behind that is there's a lot of industry operators, um, like COOs of Airbnb, um, founders of NerdWallet, CTOs of Cisco. These are people that are raising their hands and said, I will help them to succeed faster. And so for us, when we look at this network of our investors and their friends, we've actually mapped out about 2,000 people that we have a direct link to, uh, mapped them out based upon industry expertise, business influence, stage of help, and willingness to help. Uh, and that allows us to effectively say, no matter what, if you're, if you're doing a plant-based protein, or you're doing driverless trucking, or you're doing radar for senior living facilities, it doesn't matter, we can find people that can help you. And the one thing I've, I've recognized is that I love about this population that we invest in is that they're very coachable. And when you're coachable, people want to spend time with you. And so that, that to me is the delta between that success and failure. Because as a first time entrepreneur, especially when you're trying to do enterprise sales, good luck getting that first customer, customer close without somebody having that relationship, making that introduction, so that all your technical knowledge and your product knowledge can actually now articulate itself into customer revenue. That is the difference. And so we've spent a lot of time on this. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have a wide, wide network, uh, but we're never stopped building it. So that's our approach. Sure. Um, this is like when you arrive here, you've got to take advantage of the place. And what's amazing about Silicon Valley and, and the ethos is that people want to pay forward. Um, and they genuinely, you know, take meetings with strangers. So if you're a, a, an immigrant founder who just moved here, you've got to take advantage of this unique opportunity that this fantastic ecosystem provides. And frankly, you know, being on the investor side, it's a great uh, proxy for us to value it for the people who would go the extra mile, for the people who are good networkers, for the people who don't compromise for uh, shooting, you know, for the best advisors, you know, out there possible. And it's a great hack if you're a founder who just came here, you're out of network, you don't know anybody. But since you probably are ridiculously passionate about what you're doing, it's not that hard to convince one person who is um, high quality and can connect you with everybody else. Like if you can't do that, like if you can't convince one person who is well networked and can introduce you to all the investors you need or the press or um, a few uh, high quality VP of marketing folks, why are you in business? Um, so that's something that you know, we want to see. Uh, and I remember, you know, when I arrived here in 2009, I was a graduate student at Sanford, good colleague of ours. It was called emailing and not mask, and a bunch of people that I love them before taking meetings with us. So if I could do it, you know, uh, and I was nobody, uh, I can't see a reason, you know, why uh, folks today do not do that. There's so many people here who want to pay for, uh, as, as you know, when I said before. They're really going to try to sell the cheese as well. Probably. <laughs> I mean, I I think Lana and Nico had made great points. Having practice venture capital in China and have been part of the community in China and now a part of the Valley, I can say, you know, China, China still really looks to um, the Valley and the literature and the dialogue as it's building out and continues to build out its tech ecosystem. The, the giving back culture and the openness um, and the openness to immigration, give, even despite all of the challenges we have with people who are fighting, it makes the value unique and it is really important to take advantage of it, of it, um, of, of it definitely. So. Yeah, so what I would say, you know, like if, as, as somebody you know, who just moved here, is planning to move here, um, you have to be really good at your cold emailing skills. Yeah. And like, you have nothing to lose, honestly. Now, the worst thing that can happen is you can be ignored. Which is not that bad, you know. That's why. At the end of yeah. the day, yeah, it's not really bad. Um, and, and, and as far as, you know, as I'm concerned, like, my most recent investment, Series A stage, really early stage investment, you know, that founder, 
emailed me a, a year ago, you know, three months to the day. He said, hey, I just moved here, uh, I've read about you, wanna uh, come and pitch you. Um, and I met him, he just getting started, helped him introduce some people, because he was probably a mistake. Uh, raised the seed round from amazing folks, because he found one good advisor who was a notable entrepreneur, and that person to be able to and connect with him. And then we kept in touch, and a few you know, months later, you know, we ended up investing. So there, there, there's a lot of value you know, being on the receiving end. You know, if you've just you know, like done it once, and you know, when somebody told you know, you invested in that person, or you make great friends with, or you recruited that person for a portfolio company, you'll never forget, you know, to always you know, see what, what comes in, and if it's a value, why not? I might think you have to remember, for all those that are looking to kind of come to Silicon Valley, the one truth I will share with you is that there's a lot of inside baseball being played. A lot of insider information being shared. A lot of people are are talking about companies to invest in within their influence circles. Right or wrong is a separate discussion, but that is just where we are today. And so, one of the things that we do as an early stage investor is recognize that, and we strongly encourage our founders and try to help plug them into those influence circles because they are willing to help. Um, and that may actually mean that they want to invest alongside of us, be a co-investor. If you look at a lot of the Sequoia and Lightspeed Scouts, that's their job, to find early stage funds that they can invest co uh, align with and, and then help. Um, that's why we try to get multiple companies into YC, we now have three. So we're pre-YC, get three there, that gives them the amplification, that, they, that, that little nudge that they need. It doesn't guarantee success, let's not get confused by that, but it does help, right? It helps somebody that it doesn't really have uh, a great res a great notable resume in the U.S. doesn't have that network, and now puts them into a position of saying, "Hey, now you need to look at me. Give them a shot." Uh, and so I think that's the one piece that I have come to appreciate more and more as a venture capitalist is if I'm going to be most helpful, it actually has to be helpful in terms of building that that influence circle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just on, on that point, as a quick tip tip ah, tip sorry French. French accent coming again. Um, the, uh, there's a couple of tools now public. One is called Angel, A-I-N-G-E-L, and one NFX just released, to, released today that actually helps startups evaluate which ones are the VCs that are more, more likely to match with them. So it's probably a great way to start uh, your cold calling or cold emailing and tracking because uh, it's becoming easier to figure out who are potential good fits for you. Um, with a few minutes left, maybe two last questions. We've talked a little about advice, but if, if founders in the room have to take one thing, in addition to move here, cold emailing, and finding influencers, what's the one thing they can do to either come here, change their business, or change their thinking about being in a startup and making them successful? And then, different question, which but to give a bit of inspiration to everybody in the room, which is the foreign founded company that you would have loved to invest in. It can be anything you want. Uh, okay, so many. I know that that's just so one. many. Can I say Google? You can say Google. <laughs> Uber. Sure. So you guys, you want to start? Advice in one company you would have loved to invest in? Sure. Um, I mean, starting a company is a very personal experience. And even though there have been many immigrants who have succeeded and um, established industries to tackle, I think it, all the time people are just blazing their own paths and there's such an interdisciplinary nature of new sectors and platforms developing. So it's, it's really hard to get advice in one place or know this is the right way. I think you can get all the advice in the world and ability to be really genuine, to really be honest with yourself, with your strengths and weaknesses. Where are you better at? Where are you worse at? Which country would you do better at? Which country would you do worse at? Is really important. Um, I mean, yeah, there are so many amazing companies. Um, like, I mean, Totiao is such a force in China. You've got Wish, you've got, you know, Musical.ly. Um, I love biotech. So I love, like I, I love like Ginkgo, uh, Ginkgo and Zyvergen. Um, yeah. That's a good list. Good list, yeah. Um, I, I saw which that come early on, and then, yeah, uh, wow. and then I realized, you know, like price, you know, really matters, which is something always to remember, you know, because I couldn't relate as a lot of the customer. So that's, you know, that break the pattern recognition, you know, learning that I had from that meeting, like I met the wisdom of founders, they couldn't care less about their customers, their products, or that crowd. 
but they were like, oh, price matters. If it's the cheapest um, option out there, somebody will buy it. And I clearly missed on that one. So advice for um, founders coming here. Um, always go back and um, try to um, revise your initial hypothesis. So when you're a founder but just getting started on something, you're insanely passionate, you want to be go, 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 have some unique insights. But then often, uh, if you don't have the experience, you don't go back um, every month or so to really see if these initial insights uh, are still uh, standing in the true. Uh, so you may be executing six months in, but based on the plan that you put together six months in the, in the past, and the market has changed, the competitive landscape has changed, all the new information that came in um, might have not you know, made it into your product. So always going back and revising your plan uh, and proof testing it with the market when you hear from your customers is probably you know, uh, the piece of advice that we give to the past and founders. But all that said, the only reason why companies, you know, uh, fails because they run out of cash. There's no other reason. So if you can raise enough you know, money along the way, that's a powerful skill to develop. I'll actually build on what Nico said, and, I, and this is probably the most common reason why we don't end, end up investing in a company, and that's a lack of customer discovery work before you start your company. And what I mean by that is, there's three questions we'll typically ask. How much is a customer willing to pay you? What's the most they're willing to pay you? And at what point they tell you to F off, I'm not going to pay you part of the language. Uh, and the reason is before you start a company, I believe that you should have a hypothesis at minimum around what pain point are you solving, what's your MVP solution, who does your customer look like, are they large SMBs or are they large enterprises or small SMBs, what's the sales that's going to look like, and ultimately who do you have to hire, how much money do you need. I'm not saying those are going to change. Those aren't going to change. They will change. But I think before you start your company, you should know if you're building a product that you're going to charge $90 a month, but it's going to be sold to large enterprises and going to take you nine months to close that deal, you're probably not going to be venture fundable after this, if even this. And so that customer discovery work is really important. And I think it helps alleviate a lot of false starts and makes you hone in on the value proposition a little bit faster. Awesome. What advice would you have? Um, one that I've been playing a lot with is around weekly goals and essentially setting up weekly goals, probably three to five. Uh, they don't have to be lofty goals, uh, just the consistency you find in the very early stages, the consistency of teams that actually set goals weekly and hit them uh, is a very strong predictor of their ability to success. So don't know yet if it's correlation or causation, but it's probably a good discipline to have anyways. All right. Company, two companies you wish you had invested in? Wish.com, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wish to the very right. Wish.com. Right. 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 Um, I'll say, had I known App Dynamics, Joe T. Bunsell, mm -hmm. primarily because he had to wait for his green card to start his company. He was on an H1B and he couldn't do it until he got his green card. Maybe that's why he got the timing right to get started. Yeah. Eight years anyway. Yeah. Every yeah. obstacle, right? It worked. All right. Thanks very much. Cool.